All right, well, welcome to our June monthly meeting at the Saugatuck Douglas History Center. Uh, tonight, I'm your host, I'm Eric Galanik, the director at the History Center. And uh, our program for tonight is really looking at rapid response collecting and collecting in a time of crisis. And we'll sh I'm gonna share some of the backstory behind the Tri-Community Shutdown project. Uh, we had a number of people, a number of our members and community members who contributed to this. We'll get to see some of those contributions uh, in a little bit later. Uh, but I also wanted to just put this into some context of thinking about the work that the center does and our uh, kind of new directions in museum practice so we can uh, think about how do we collect the now? How do we collect contemporary things? Uh, that are going on. The mission of the Saugatuck Douglas History Center is to preserve local history and inspire learning to inform and improve our community. And this project really fits well within that in that it's uh, very much community-centered and community-driven. Uh, these are your stories that we're collecting and then sharing out and placing into context. I want to give some acknowledgement uh, of uh, the support that we receive from uh, foundations uh, and, and agencies, uh, the Allegan County Community Foundation, the longtime supporter of the History Center with their Foundation Legacy Grant, uh, the Michigan Council for the Arts and Cultural Affairs and National Endowment for the Arts uh, supports our work. And we are also the recipients of the Michigan Humanities Organization's Pandemic Emergency or HOPE grant. Uh, and so this funding has been provided by Michigan Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the CARES Act. Uh, and uh, most significantly, uh, our members. Uh, and so, uh, it, we appreciate your support as members. Our, our membership mailings and announcements went out uh, back in early April, and uh, we'd appreciate your support in uh, renewing your membership that allows us to bring programs like these to you. Uh, if you're from out of the area, uh, it's uh, worth giving you some orientation to the History Center uh, and our work. Uh, we're a volunteer-driven organization. We maintain two historic buildings uh, as our sites and campuses in Douglas at the Union Schoolhouse built in 1866 and um, restored around 2008. And the pump house, historic pump house building uh, right on the banks of the Kalamazoo River built in 1904 and uh, restored uh, by the Historical Society, uh, Art History Center uh, back in 1992. Uh, and we use both of these for programming and sites and in normal times, uh, of course, most of our work now has been uh, shifted to online, and uh, we're hoping to have some exciting announcements about that uh, in the near future. Uh, but it's really important, I think, to understand the History Center as a volunteer-driven organization. We counted up 130 volunteers uh, that assisted with programs, exhibits, uh, volunteering, opening our buildings, and engaging with the, with the public. And uh, so our projects are, are really rooted in the community and what people are doing uh, in those ways. Uh, so I thought I'd start out and just share a little bit about uh, the kind of bigger question of this, you know, collecting during, collecting stories, collecting COVID-19 stories. And uh, you've probably seen articles in the last three months of museums and libraries around the state and even around the world collecting uh, materials uh, around the COVID-19 pandemic and documenting history in the making. And so this program uh, is really both the, the, the Tri-Community Shutdown Project uh, and the program tonight is looking at uh, why we do this, what's changed in museums uh, that, have, that has folks thinking about contemporary history, uh, today as tomorrow's history. And, uh, it, and maybe to think about the meaning of all of this in our lives today. So uh, you know, why collect COVID-19 stories? Um, we've had a, a few months, I've had a few months to think about this. And I think one of the points that stood out to me is uh, 
it's so important right now for us as as human beings to put stories to what's happening around the world uh, during the pandemic, and especially because there's so much emphasis on numbers, uh, and so we're inundated. You know, probably the the definitive image of COVID-19 uh, is flattening the curve, right? And that um, iconic uh, graph uh, that we see on the on the left of the screen. And what's missing in that are really those human stories, the faces of the people who are actually managing stress or are concerned about health, are caring for uh, others. And so uh, the Tri-Community Shutdown Project focused on photographs and on community members submitting photographs that would help us understand that those experiences and those, those lives. Uh, so we have a better sense of this as we look to the future. And one of the things that really drove the project was the immediate comparisons to the 1918 and 1919 influenza, uh, often referred to as the Spanish flu uh, back in 1918. And we were surprised to learn uh, you know, how little we know about the 1918 influenza in Saugatuck Douglas. Uh, we don't know much about it. We know a little bit. Uh, there's a newsletter article from back in April uh, that gives some information on that. Uh, but this is, these are some images from the commercial record back in October of 1918. And uh, we see there that there was a few references to the disease, 18 well-pronounced cases of flu reported to health officers of the two villages, representing nine families. And so uh, th there's a lot of familiar elements to this now as we've lived through these experiences uh, over the last few months. We can relate to this, the, uh, the questions about uh, you know, testing, about the certainty of, of uh, the spread of the illness, the numbers of people who have it, and questions about treatment and effectiveness as well. The article makes mention of the Rossinal vaccine. Uh, and uh, you may know that there, there wasn't a vaccine. Uh, there was no effective vaccine uh, for the uh, influenza A in 1918. In fact, they had uh, developed a, a vaccine based on cultures of bacteria uh, that had been uh, present in those who had, had died of the influenza. Uh, of course, it's a virus, so there isn't a, a vaccine. Um, and they didn't understand viruses in 1918. It took another, another decade uh, before that uh, science advanced to that level. So we see familiar patterns as we look to the past and make sense of, of this history. Uh, and I think uh, when Jim Cook, uh, SDHC board member and, and renowned photographer, kind of started thinking about this, he really pitched this idea of, of, of photography, of a day in the lifestyle photography, crowdsourced, individuals submitting photos, because we just lack so much information of that basic human story about 1918. Uh, we can look at the quantitative data that we have from 1918 and 1919. Uh, and see uh, the surge in, in deaths uh, that happened in October. That was really the spike uh, in, uh, at the lakeshore at that time period. Uh, but we don't have those human, uh, those human uh, elements so much. This is, a, this is a photograph from California, likely from late 1918 during the influenza in the it's a great image that made uh, the rounds from historical society there in, in Dublin, California, uh, that features uh, the whole family wearing homemade masks, including the cat. You can see the uh, feline there with the mask and the detail uh, with the photo. Uh, so the History Center has a, a history, a long uh, tradition of collecting, uh, but maybe a bit different than other historical organizations. And it has some impact on, on the kind of work we're doing now and our position going forward. Uh, because of the, the origins of the Historical Society in 1986, our first building in, in the 1990s, uh, it's not a traditional collecting-driven organization. And it was, in fact, in 2018, the year of collections at the History Center, that uh, we were able to raise money and convert the second floor uh, of the schoolhouse building into a dedicated archive and secure archive space. We see some of that being installed in the photographs here. And as far as collecting goes, 
Uh, there's always been an emphasis at the center on collecting oral history and collecting the stories of people from the community, on um, scanning and digitizing photographs and preserving those uh, for the future. And so it was back in 2017, 2018, uh, and then culminating in the summer of 2019 that the Stories of Summer collaboration with Grand Valley uh, came into being. And the purpose of Stories of Summer was to really use a volunteer-driven, community-driven culture and heritage project that would encourage people to bring materials to the center to be digitized uh, and then made accessible. And we see some volunteers, community members, and staff all working together at the schoolhouse back in 2018, uh, collecting that material. We were able to interview 34 community members. We have 40 hours of oral history that came out of that and thousands of images. And many of you were at the opening or saw the exhibit last summer, uh, which featured this overview of history uh, at the center uh, that Grand Valley had produced uh, uh, the, the storyboards uh, and uh, we, curated the show and uh, complemented it with original art and artifacts uh, to really give a sense of what, what the community was like in the mid 20th century. And some of the impetus for this project was to preserve the past, uh, but also to capture the important stories and lived experiences of, of people from across the community. Um, there was also uh, an interest in making this material available. So if you go on to Grand Valley's uh, special collections page, you can actually browse through parts of the collection, um, oral history interviews transcribed and photographs that were scanned uh, that are available there. Uh, you get a little sense of the, the variety of, of material that uh, was brought in as part of this history harvest model. Uh, whatever people brought in and things we had in the collection in need of scanning and in need, in need of curation, uh, those uh, were brought in. So everything from recreation on the water, uh, sailing to uh, the history of the dunes, Douglas Dunes Resort. And uh, this was really an important part of the project uh, was to capture the experiences of underrepresented populations and the LGBTQ history of the area was certainly part of the, the, the impetus for the project. Uh, and we were able to interview both Carl and Larry uh, and uh, record some, some really important information about life in Saugatuck Douglas from the 1960s uh, through to the 2000s. Uh, and especially important as a reminder to, uh, as Carl passed away, uh, that in the winter of, of 2019, uh, important to have those stories of uh, the founding of, of the Douglas uh, Dunes Resort, uh, and accounts of discrimination, violence, uh, and ultimately of success in the area. Uh, and some of this history uh, was also uh, instrumental in uh, the ongoing project uh, started about 15 years ago, but uh, slated for opening uh, this late this summer now with the COVID delays, uh, a century of progress, a, an LGBTQ timeline project uh, based on some of this collecting. So, I brought this in because I wanted to share some of the background of how the History Center collects. Um, I also wanted to put it into some larger context of what other museums and, and organizations are doing as well. Uh, one of the benefits, you might say, or silver lining of uh, the COVID shutdown uh, is lots of professionals all around the country are able to do virtual programs like this. Uh, so I was on a call just uh, last week uh, with the curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and he shared some of their collecting history uh, and uh, in building their LGBTQ collection specifically. Uh, and we see some of these. Uh, ephemera from the first Pride uh, in 1970, a collection cup, donation cup, uh, handmade and hand-lettered in a button uh, that was used there, donated by Mark Seagal. Uh, the publisher, uh, editor in, 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 uh, in the East Coast. And this is the exhibit that's up at the National Museum of American History right now, Illegal to be You, Gay History Beyond Stonewall. And there's some familiar elements to this if we think about the kinds of exhibits that the History Center has put together 
uh, and continues to put together in terms of bringing assemblages of objects, photographs, and, and uh, text uh, together. Uh, so I thought this was just, just an interesting example of how we, you know, how curators, even at an organization like the Smithsonian, are going out in the community and soliciting materials, everyday kinds of artifacts, uh, and bringing those in. The New York Public Library last year had a Stonewall 50 exhibit, and uh, I was able to visit this, and I was really struck by the very similar kinds of items that the New York Public Library has collected, similar to things that we have in our collection and that tell stories in our community. Uh, things like uh, zine magazines, um, invitations, posters, photographs, and other ephemera as well. Uh, and we can think about this in a co contemporary collecting context because the History Center is actively seeking and collecting things, not just from 50 years ago, but things that are happening in our community right now. And we really rely on our volunteers and members uh, to share items uh, as they're happening. So Douglas Community Pride, uh, the first Pride Festival uh, in Saugatuck Douglas last year, um, buttons, posters, photographs of uh, the, the Rainbow Crosswalk, um, all important elements to bring together. And I thought I'd put this into some context as well around rapid response collecting to in social, social action, uh, the Saugatuck Douglas Women's Marches. Uh, we can think about political protests as generating lots of common uh, kinds of artifacts, uh, handmade signs, sewn hats, knit hats, uh, and uh, these all have some important things, you know, have power that uh, live on as symbols and as works of craft, or as we'll look at in a minute, craftivism itself. Uh, and, you know, this isn't something that I'm making up, right? This is an idea that has wide currency. So uh, the Victorian Albert Museum in London uh, is really the credited as the innovators of this term of rapid response collecting. And the idea behind this is uh, a new kind of collecting activity where museums acquire objects in response to major movements in recent history, rather than waiting for decades to go by and then going out to seek out these significant objects. The Victorian Albert Museum is probably the great museum of design and manufacturing in the world. Uh, and so there's a great emphasis on craft and on commodities uh, that they're collecting. Uh, but this is a, a, a pussy hat that they collected uh, back in 2017. They brought into the collection at the, at the Victorian Albert Museum. Uh, and you can get some sense of the significance of this, of, of this object that, you know, worn by an estimated half a million people uh, in January of 2017. And so uh, we can think of contemporary collecting as something that's uh, you know, embodies important values uh, about the moment in time, uh, and also as, as artifacts really embodies the, the values of the makers and users of those things themselves. Uh, so we can think of uh, the knit hat as something that was a, a political symbol, uh, but also as something that was, uh, really symbolizes a kind of unity and connection uh, that uh, as the curators at the Mich at Michigan State University, the Knitting the Resistance exhibit in, in 2017 put it, uh, they said uh, the unity extended through social media surrounding the creation and distribution of hats from individual knitting for family members and friends to knitting circles and clubs to craft shops and suppliers. So uh, everything has a history and I, I just love kind of looking at these photos as a material culture person, uh, art historian, and thinking about you know, the variety of all of these forms and material uh, in shape, uh, in thinking about this, this model of, of craftivism that uh, is kind of the use of traditional arts, uh, of handmade objects uh, that are deliberate, well thought out, time consuming, artistic and skilled, requiring skilled labor that are then uh, deployed in a way through those social networks that people are, you know, feel empowered. Uh, they're making a statement. And that's something that, uh, you know, important to, to be aware of and to collect. I mean, we imagine the significance of, of these forms 
in the in the near future, uh, you know, uh, people will want to see examples of these and know what what exactly did that look like? How was that made? How did that work? Uh, from a slightly different uh, slightly different perspective, we can think of contemporary collecting or rapid response collecting in a digital age as uh, you know, taking place online. How do we record activism, political organizing uh, that uh, is, is taking place largely on Twitter or on Instagram or Facebook? Uh, so uh, Black Lives Matter as a movement uh, gains uh, momentum in August of 2014, uh, after uh, political organizing in, in marches and violence in Ferguson, Missouri, following the, the death of Michael Brown. And curators really kind of thought about these questions, or archivists thought about these questions. How do we record, uh, how do we do rapid response collecting uh, of online material? And so uh, the archive it. Uh, program uh, began recording uh, social media, recording uh, tweets, uh, websites, blogs, and other social media uh, that uh, used that hashtag Black Lives Matter and that intersected with activism in or around Ferguson and, and the death of Michael Brown specifically. Uh, and then, of course, this, this continued over time. So you can actually go online through Washington University in St. Louis and view archived material. Uh, born digital uh, elements that are archived from the web. Uh, and this, of course, raises a lot of ethical issues around collecting social media. Uh, do you have a right as an archivist to save someone's tweet? Uh, if they go and delete their tweet later, uh, should you also delete that from the archive or not? Uh, there's questions about terms of service agreements. How do you uh, decide, uh, you know, do you save things that Twitter decides to remove by their terms of service agreement? This is all important, I think, to understand uh, as we look at contemporary collecting uh, in the COVID age, because we're collecting material primary online. Curators and archivists aren't working on site. They're not collecting physical material. Along those same lines, uh, we can see uh, the profusion of artifacts uh, that are created, often uh, incredibly powerful, uh, culturally significant uh, examples of, of art and artifacts made, whether it's signs uh, or uh, murals uh, painted. Uh, this one, the, probably the most uh, iconic uh, that we've seen, uh, that was painted uh, immediately after George Floyd's death uh, in Minneapolis on the site where, where he died. Uh, and uh, has been widely reproduced already. Uh, but it sort of raises questions of thinking about art and the importance of documenting or even caring for or collecting artwork uh, during time of crisis. Uh, and uh, we can see these are some photographs from Grand Rapids, uh, boarded up windows that have been decorated, have, been, have had uh, political messages, artistic uh, uh, creations, paintings made on them. We can see some of the process of, of creation in some of the photographs that are circulating uh, online on social media platforms, uh, and questions about what will happen to these things. Many people have asked questions of where will these go? Uh, will they, you know, will the store owners get them? Uh, will museums try to collect them? Will there be exhibits of this material later? And so these are all uh, questions that we grapple with as we think about collecting the recent past. We have so much material that could potentially be collected. Uh, we're limited in thinking about the means of collecting and processing and storing and caring for uh, these items. But uh, as we get to the end of the program today, I'll share a little bit about next steps in collecting uh, around COVID-19 and the Tri-Community Shutdown Project. Uh, but looking at uh, uh, looking at our project in some detail, what have we learned? How did it start? Uh, uh, the project began uh, really 
in looking at what other organizations are doing. And I think that basic human sense that this is, we are living history. Uh, and so back in the end of March, uh, Jim Cook and, and spoke to me and said, you know, we should really try to put a project together. Um, I also give uh, credit to, uh, uh, give, give credit to Ingrid Boyer uh, at the Saugatuck District Library who also reached out to me and said, hey, you know, there's a lot of libraries that are thinking about these ideas uh, in Grand Rapids and at the Michigan Library, the Library of Michigan. Um, hey, I don't know if you're interested in this. And indeed, I was very much so. So um, we got this project started. I reached out to Julie Taborer, uh, Director of Special Collections and Archives at the Grand Rapids Public Library, and talked to them about their project. They had just launched this uh, uh, in the last week of March. So uh, it was a ready example to talk with her about uh, their experiences. Uh, and they were primarily focused on collecting answers to questions. Uh, collecting written responses from members of the community and saving them using a web form uh, and then saving those. And uh, we said, all right, this sounds like a good idea, uh, but we really love the photo-based project. We thought that might be even more accessible. Uh, people don't have to feel they need to give their name. They don't need to write a lengthy description, but just observing what's happening and going on around them. Uh, in reporting that. So we did those, uh, we put those elements into place uh, and launched the project. Uh, and uh, Jim's uh, photo uh, really kicked things off, his open shutdown photograph, which uh, became the, the source for our, our header and promotion of the project, uh, and captured here in, here in Douglas. Uh, and just all the layers of uh, complexity of this moment in uh, late March and early April uh, of things, uh, events that had already happened, events that were uh, promoted for the near future that may or may not happen. It turns out these didn't happen. Uh, and adjustments of schedule and takeout, uh, and yet still open. And it seems like a powerful image uh, with many layers to it that spoke to the moment that we're, uh, we're living through. Um, at that at that at the, that early point in in time, we encourage people to share photographs through social media using the hashtag 3C Shutdown for Tri Community Shutdown. Uh, we did some searching to make sure that there were no other uses for that hashtag uh, that it would be unique to our project and to our community, and indeed it, it appears to be. And we encourage people to post photos to tag the History Center on Instagram. Uh, or on Facebook, and to uh, use that hashtag. And so uh, we saw, you know, really, uh, really wonderful responses to this uh, from individuals, from organizations, uh, and a great variety of different different messages as well. Uh, people, uh, you know, truly in shutdown, uh, 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 left in isolation uh, during the the stay-at-home order, uh, images of uh, you know, scarcity in, in grocery stores, uh, especially in the early weeks of the, of the pandemic and, and of the shutdown order, uh, which is unlike anything most of us have seen in our, in our time. Uh, meetings on Zoom uh, and connecting via technology uh, in new ways. You know, I, I don't know how many of you had ever used Zoom uh, before, say, March the 15th or March the 30th. I had not, uh, but it's become, you know, an indispensable part of how we're all working and, and learning uh, and connecting all the time. Shopping uh, and new sort of rituals and comportment of mask wearing and hand washing and glove wearing, uh, photos submitted uh, via social media activities uh, that uh, folks shared online uh, that they were doing that they saw as part of uh, staying active and giving back in the community during during this time. Uh, clean up. Uh, clean up during the nicer weather that we had uh, the end of March. Lots of sidewalk art, chalk art projects uh, that folks submitted 
uh, by email or on social media again. Uh, ways of staying connected, uh, board meetings and, and meetups uh, online, neighbors gathering uh, outdoors, social distancing uh, back in April. Uh, so a sense of perseverance and social connection in spite of uh, social distancing. Original artwork and captions, it's this kind of fusion of text and image together uh, with something that I think Facebook is particularly good at, a uh, particularly good medium for that. Uh, and so we saw some submissions like this that had uh, really powerful captions and text with them uh, that also went with the image itself. And uh, you know, probably the, 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 the most activity uh, that we saw uh, was around Easter weekend uh, and both in Saugatuck and Douglas, the, uh, uh, the Easter Bunny came out to share toilet paper, the, the, the great scarce commodity of, uh, of the spring of 2020, uh, and set up uh, on the street. Uh, we saw these Easter trees, Easter egg trees, uh, and folks wearing masks. Uh, folks wearing masks, picking up, supporting local businesses and restaurants, picking up uh, food. Uh, for takeout, for Easter Sunday brunches and, and, and meals. More bunnies. Humor. Easter hats and uh, Easter uh, rolls. And social media posts uh, as well um, around church services and remote uh, worship. Uh, Pastor Sal uh, in an empty church uh, recording his sermon uh, for delivery on Sunday. And uh, this, this great moment shared with us by email of, of uh, photographs of parishioners and uh, all helping uh, kind of humanize, put a face to uh, these difficult times. Uh, art photography that was submitted as well, uh, people thinking about making art, uh, the Saugata Douglas Art Club uh, did some great projects during this time sharing uh, prompts uh, for creative exercises. Uh, and uh, some of these uh, were related to those other work that would be great to collect and bring together to help I'll bring this to life. Uh, but lots of photographs of the indoors looking out. Uh, certainly one of the themes that stands out, people truly staying at home uh, and making art that looks out to the world. Part of this, and most recently, uh, photographs of the, the senior Saugatuck High School seniors parade. Uh, and we see some photos submitted uh, of that, of car parades. Uh, something that uh, totally new uh, and certainly distinctive. People will be interested in seeing uh, evidence of this, the record of this uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, th thinking about uh, collecting and, and archive it projects, um, I was struck to thinking about this and as I'm wrapping up, uh, looking at examples and open this up for some discussion, I was really intrigued. I saw this post on Twitter from Guardian Brewing uh, and this post talking about reopening. And uh, it really got me thinking about our Tri-Community Shutdown project and uh, really the next stage. Uh, we're not back to normal. We won't go back to normal for some time. Uh, but I think there's an important moment here for, for reflection. And so I think as we look at this project, uh, we can, it's not too late to submit stories and images if you kept a diary uh, during this time period and you want to share excerpts of that. I'll show you where you can, how you can do that. Uh, and images the same way. History Center is very interested in collecting those, those stories. Uh, but I think as we're, as we're entering summer, as we're in June, uh, it's really a powerful time to reflect on what we've experienced uh, and to think about, you know, what do we make of uh, reop the reopening process itself? Um, how does that feel for all of us as we check in? Uh, what hopes do we have? What struggles are we are we are we feeling uh, as we look ahead? Uh, what stories did you hear among friends, neighbors, and family around COVID nineteen illness during this during this time? 
Uh, and how are businesses dealing in coping with social distancing requirements and expectations of customers um, all during this time? Uh, so I mentioned we've been working with the library um, on, from the beginning on this project, and uh, we were grateful to have their, their support, uh, not just from Ingrid, but also from Hannah and Lindick Mason, uh, who has uh, helped spread the word uh, to library patrons that, hey, we, we want your stories. We want you to uh, share your images, but also your, your experiences. Uh, and you can do that conveniently in just a few minutes um, on our uh, web form on our Google form uh, where we can record those and share those for the, for the future looking ahead. Uh, so the next steps in our collecting, I would say, are thinking about, uh, you know, those reflections, uh, but also I think thinking about artifacts. And we'd be very interested, you know, if you have uh, things like menus or original artwork or eventually masks uh, that uh, you, you may have extra uh, save, hold on to those things. Those would be interesting things for us to have in our collections. Uh, other things, uh, unique decorated hand sanitizer bottles uh, or empty hand sanitizer bottles that might be distinctive in some way uh, or puzzles, right, was another category that people have uh, also talked about. So uh, I, uh, appreciate uh, your patience with this. I'd like to open this up to some questions. Uh, let me um, see if I can get to our participant window here and our chat. If you're going to drop out of our, our share and uh, come back to you here. Any responses or any uh, uh, observations that you had sort of thinking about the project or your own experiences, um, you're able, you should be able to unmute yourself um, if you would like to uh, ask a question or share a story, you'd love to hear it. I was just wondering how, um, how local that needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some pictures I took in, in Holland. Yeah. But would they, would you want those or do you want only the local? Saugatuck, Douglas. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, our mission really focuses on Saugatuck Township and Douglas, Saugatuck. Uh, but I think given the connection, certainly your connections here run deep. Uh, and I think anyone that has considered Saugatuck a home, uh, it would be really uh, valuable to have that, to have those stories or, or those photographs of, of your experiences during this time. So yeah, I think that's great. And I've, uh, we haven't had any submissions like this, uh, but I, I hope we can do some outreach, you know, even for folks who are if you were in Florida or California during this time uh, and were staying connected with folks here, what was your life like? What was that like? What was the, uh, how did you manage the uncertainty about what was happening uh, here in Saugatuck Douglas uh, while you were, you know, sheltered in, sheltered in place, right? Or, or uh, uh, staying home in your other home, right? So I think those are, those are really good questions and, and points to think about. Hi, uh, I'm Lynn Ripley. Uh, the question I had was that uh, adding on to the idea of your oral histories would be to get some over, t perhaps over time to some degree, but multi-generational stories from single families where you might later on get stories from the children of what they remember from this time versus what the adults remember yeah I think that's a great comment Lynn and uh, I think the more perspectives we can have the better uh, and I like your idea of, of somehow trying to keep those cataloging those in a way that they can be kept in connection uh, so you can see those connections later 
um, especially, you know. Do um, well if you make some connections with uh, uh, school teachers in the Saugatuck mm -hmm. school. They might generate a writing project of some sort that the mm -hmm. kids can write. Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion. One of the things we're hoping to work on, uh, I see Hannah on the call. Uh, we had talked about through the library to possibly promote this as a summer writing project uh, idea. Uh, one of the challenges with the project is as it got going, uh, there was a fair amount of it, uh, enthusiasm you know, among people to, to journal and to keep busy, I think in, in March and in early April. And I think mm -hmm. by late April and heading into May, uh, particularly once school resumed for students for remote learning plans kicked in, uh, you know, folks weren't as excited to sit and do more writing on their computer <laughs> uh, while they were trying to manage all their online lessons and assignments. So I think that uh, as we get in the summer, that's a great idea to come back to and encourage that reflective writing of, you know, hey, what, what, what what was the experience like? What were the things you remember that stand out now three months later? Uh, so yeah, that's a great, great idea. Other comments or questions? Eric, I was just gonna say that um, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very valuable. I, I liked seeing all the work that's already gone into this. I'm wondering, have you worked with the uh, Saugatuck Center for the Arts regarding this period? Not directly, no. Um, you know, they had contributed some material to the project early on, but we haven't directly collaborated with them on the project. Okay. Uh, I, think I think they, they might will be later this summer, actually, with one of their camps, but yeah. All right, I think they might have a lot to add, so yeah. it might be worthwhile. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Mike, thanks. Another suggestion was that is that you said you were interested in getting information from people who had been away for the winter, mm -hmm. and um, the numbers of people infected and how many were hospitalized and died and all that sort of stuff are all available online by yeah. county, and uh, so it might be interesting to compare impressions from places like Allegan County, which are relatively unaffected mm -hmm. uh, compared to like where I live, it's New York City, uh, mm -hmm. it's not relatively affected. And, it, and it's been my experience when I, I send out emails from time to time of friends that I call notes from the epicenter. And mm -hmm. that gen generally results in, supply, in replies from my friends, which are actually quite different from my own in terms of their experience. Yeah, that's that's a really uh, excellent point, and yeah, would love to hear some of your some of your see some of your writing or, some, or hear some of your ideas as well uh, for this. But yeah, I think the comparison of uh, the very different experiences that that folks have had uh, and will and will continue to have will will vary so much. Uh, you know, and the multi generational uh, dimension is, is certainly one, but uh, many other factors that we could, we could, uh, I think are important to collect, uh, you know, especially as someone is trying to make sense of this 50 years from now or a hundred years from now, uh, you know, to have those different voices and different viewpoints uh, and just lived experiences would be, you know, invaluable. Does anyone have any thoughts about other kinds of contemporary collecting that that seems important or other kinds of different kinds of things that this inspired you to think about? Does anybody there care about Black Lives Matter? <laughs> I mean, that that in, that that's every day here in New York. We had mm -hmm. 18 great days of marches. 
Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think there's a a, a, dem a march that's planned in Douglas on Sunday uh, this weekend, Saturday or Sunday. Uh, that would certainly be something to to, to talk about and document. Yeah, Jack. One thing that comes to mind here is this is really a uh, great opportunity to utilize Zoom to build our oral history library mm -hmm. for various people in the community. You know, I think if we worked on it, we can come up with a system where it would be quite easy to interview people. You need two. You need two things. You need the person that can be interviewed, but you need somebody to kind of conduct that interview. But when you can both be just sitting at home, talking to each other and recording the interview, mm -hmm. wow, that's a that's an easy way to build the uh, oral history library. And you know, you could be interviewing people maybe that aren't going to be around much longer, or you can be interviewing uh, people with some contemporary uh, knowledge about something that's happening, like we're talking here, the virus. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that would be uh, interviews with regards to that. You know, we could be talking to somebody in New York, like Lynn, mm -hmm. and, uh, somebody local, uh, maybe a business person that went through all the trials and tribulations of having their business closed down and maybe getting support from the government and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great suggestion, Jack. Uh, I think that would um, really work well to, uh, for one thing, the recording feature is, is quite seamless. Uh, to be able to record video and audio together. Uh, so that's a really interesting idea to think about that, using the platform that way. Yeah, because it has always been a real kind of a hassle to get everything to work right and to get somebody to come to the uh, old schoolhouse for an interview. And, uh, you really need somebody that owned the project. I don't. Do we have anybody now that is that is doing oral interviews with uh, people in the community? Not in a systematic way. Uh, we have done some interviews, but it's been uh, more sort of topical in, in getting a couple of volunteers who are motivated to do it to go out and, and record. I haven't done one for a long time. I interviewed, uh, my brother and I interviewed uh, uh, some Vietnam veterans that had seen some real had some real nasty times and seen a lot of uh, action in Vietnam. Mm. Yeah. And of course, John Shack uh, did it for a long time and uh, mm -hmm. he really got a good start on it, but I, I don't think anybody's really picked it up after he, he, got, he dropped it. Yeah, there, there were quite a few interviews done during Stories of Summer two years ago and then another Another batch that then kind of followed from that this past year, uh, we had interviewed uh, Ken Kutzel, who's on the call, it looks like, uh, had interviewed some of uh, uh, Corbus Taylor's students. Uh, so that's a, that's one uh, kind of topical direction for doing that. But yeah, I think it would be incredibly important to continue doing that work. Uh, and. Um, you know, part of the project is really to capture people's experiences um, around a, around a, a fixed moment in time. Uh, so you don't even necessarily need to be, uh, you know, an elder in order to have stories that are worth recording um, as we think about you know, COVID-19, for instance. Eric, just to go back to um, the Black Lives Matter, um, the, it's on Sunday at 2 p.m. and they're, uh, they're studying 
in Douglas at Berry Field if anyone wants to join in. Hey, thanks, Judy. Yeah, I know I had I had seen that and had that saved, but I didn't know the info. So thank you for sharing that with the community. One of the you probably one of the should be out. Oh. You're gonna undo it. Hello. We sh we should probably be out there videotaping that on Sunday. Yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Archives. To do that. Yeah. There's been a, so much emphasis on people who have continued in their work, and of course they're heroes. We say that every day about doctors and nurses, et cetera. Um, but I'm wondering if teachers are a special category because they've had to change completely. Uh, they haven't had to continue in the midst of it, but they've had to, on the spot, come up with a completely different way of teaching. One of the things that's been revealed more than ever is the value of interpersonal relationship with students. Mm -hmm. um, that just keeps coming up over and over and over again. So there's this irony that this terrible thing has happened, but it has also enabled people to realize how valuable it is to have that personal touch of the person is directly in front of you and you're eye to eye, not screen to screen. And also, I do think they're a special category. There are very few, all those people are brave and have gone and been heroes for all of us. And yet very few have had to relearn a whole, just on the spot with no training, no background. There's no, nobody's ever done it before. Um, how do you suddenly do this? Teach online somehow. And uh, most of them don't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're 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 right on. It's certainly near and dear to my heart. I've kind of lived this experience. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think that that uh, that would be a really interesting. Uh, direction to do outreach and in, in make a specific ask for, uh, you know, to capture, to record those those experiences and those feelings, um, and and likely a lot to learn out of that too. I I don't quite know how to articulate what I'm thinking here, um, so I'm going to bumble it, uh, bumble along. I'll bumble along as I usually do. Um, I think that. One of the things that has uh, struck me uh, quite a lot about this about this time is the the level of conflict uh, among people and in our community and everywhere, you know, and certainly in the state. Um, and so, I think Jack Sheridan is right that that being able to record and and learn to understand that will be coming through oral oral interviews probably more than anything. I, d I don't know how to record it any other way other than obviously the photographs that happened in, you know, what happened at, at uh, in Lansing. And, uh, you know, but the, the level of, uh, you know, capturing maybe some of this conversation, I don't even know if that's possible, that takes place on some of the, the Saugatuck Douglas Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. um, that's a rich vein to understand how people are responding to this time. And I just don't know, like you said, the ethics of that that situation is kind of fascinating. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk, I've, you know, both nationwide and, and in the state, uh, organizations of all sizes from local historical societies up to, you know, the Smithsonian up to state level, Michigan History Center or, or Maryland Historical um, are working on these kinds of projects. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of talk, you know, that so much of the, so much of the story, so much of the dialogue is taking place on social media. Yet, you know, the ethics are are pretty clear that you know, hey, we shouldn't be archiving. You know, I shouldn't go into uh, a, a private group, right, and just start screenshotting what people are posting in there 
um, to put into a box, you know, a, a virtual box in our archive. You know, that's not really appropriate uh, to, to do that. And so, so frustrating because there yeah, it is. <laughs> how, how do you go about that exactly? And so, um, yeah. you know, it's a it's an interesting question. Yeah, you know, if you think about it, we can make up a list of at least a half a dozen kind of key people involved in, in this. You got the people, the medical people. Uh, you got, uh, like we talked about before, uh, uh, business people. Certainly uh, the educational thing, that, that would be great to have some interviews. Mm -hmm. How they coped with it, what they did. Uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about businesses, remember the farmers. Mm -hmm. And the first responders, you know, I, the first responders and, and how hard, mm -hmm. extra hard they had to work, um, how many more calls they had, all, you know, all the, all the folks who got together to provide food for the kids who um, rely on our school lunch programs, that was a remarkable effort. Mm -hmm. I'd like to suggest to the people working in grocery stores, often for probably much lower wages than any of us have ever earned. Um, I think they're heroes also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Jane Underwood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great suggestion. And so one of the next steps I would say is to spread the word and to think about how we can get people to share their stories. Um, uh, and I think that's an important, uh, you know, that's something that you can all play a part in uh, is getting the word out and, and also then sharing that information. So uh, on our website, you can find the, the information for the project and how, it's, how to post to it. Uh, there's also a link there to our Google form that you can, uh, you know, supply uh, written responses. Uh, so do have a look at that and share that uh, in your networks. And if you have suggestions of people or of strategies to reach out uh, other groups that are interested in being involved in this project, uh, happy to work with, with those. I'm going to uh, follow up with the conversation uh, at the SCA. Um, after this, and uh, I know there's other community groups that would also be interested in, in helping, I'm sure. Well, we have reached the uh, eight o'clock hour. I'm happy to continue the conversation with anyone who wants to stick around. Uh, you, I, uh, you can unmute yourself if you want to say anything here, uh, but otherwise I think we'll uh, start wrap, we'll can wrap up the program. Uh, I see people waving. I'll unmute everybody. You can all say goodbye if you'd like. I will stick around till the end, but uh, it's a pleasure seeing you all. Um, I'll also send out a survey uh, tomorrow, so please fill that out. You can give some feedback that way and uh, look forward to starting to see people in person uh, from uh, some distance away, uh, but uh, seeing you around, around town with uh, a little more frequency. Great. Great. Thank you. Very Thank good. you. Nice Thank you, Eric. Bye. Bye. Take care.